Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News Webinar. It's entitled, Analyzing the Cancer Transcriptome, Illuminating the Dysfunctional Cancer Genome. RNA-Seq relies on deep sequencing methodologies to carry out transcriptome profiling. The technique has been designed for more accurate measurements of transcript levels, while also providing scientists with the ability to detect gene fusions, to better understand the expression of a particular gene's alleles, and to more precisely detect post-transcriptional mutations. RNA-seq can also provide much in-depth information on the cancer transcriptome, and that's going to be the focus of today's webinar. Our panel has a vast amount of experience using RNA-seq, so let's meet them. Dr. Abizar Lakdawala is the Marketing Manager for New Sequencing Technologies at Illumina. Dr. Lakdawala is going to discuss sequencing the transcriptome of single circulating tumor cells. Dr. Aubrey Thompson, Professor of Cancer Biology at the Mayo Clinic Comprehensive Cancer Center, will explore the use of next generation sequencing technology to model the transcriptome landscape of breast cancer. And Dr. Jeffrey Rana, Professor in the Department of Medical Genetics and Microbiology at the University of Toronto, is going to talk about analyzing the bladder cancer transcriptome by RNA-Seq. I'm John Sterling, Editor-in-Chief of GEN, and I'm going to serve as the moderator. Please feel free to enlarge the slide images or download the complete presentation. At any time during the webinar, you can send in a question for our panelists. Type your question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hit Submit. The panel will try to answer as many as possible during the Q&A segment that takes place after all the presentations have been made. So, if everyone's ready, let's get going. Dr. Abizar Lakdawala will be our lead our presenter. Abizar, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. So today I'm going to talk about a pretty exciting topic. This is sequencing single cells. And specifically, I'm going to focus on sequencing circulating tumor cells. And this is sequencing the RNA component of a single cell, which provides us an amazingly granular amount of information at single cell resolution. So in the next slide, I'm just quickly summarizing the main topics that I'm going to speak to. First is, what is the impact of RNA sequencing? So I'll quickly review what we have learned from the technology around RNA sequencing, and then I'll focus on the method that we are using to sequence a single individual circulating tumor cells and the data and the interpretation associated with that. So in the next slide, I'll kind of start off by saying a lot of what I'm going to talk about has been enabled by an amazing transformation in the way we generate sequence data. So as many of you are aware, next generation sequencing platforms have jumped up the output by such massive amounts I mean, honestly, if you had asked me a few years ago if I could have anticipated this, I would have pretty much laughed at you. But now we can generate almost terabytes, a terabases of data in a single run. And the graph that I'm showing you shows the rapid pace of improvement in data generation, which has led to an incredible decrease in the cost. Like from a few million dollars to do a human genome, now it's just a few thousand dollars. A very, very easy way to translate that is one HiSeq 2000, a high-throughput sequencer, produces as much data as 60,000 of the 3730, the first-generation sequencer. So you have a 1 to 60,000 ratio. And this has allowed us to study the cancer genome and transcriptome at just an incredible depth and resolution. In the next slide, I'm going to show you how RNA sequencing is done. So first is RNA sequencing opens a window into the functional cancer genome at a resolution that most people would not have even imagined. You can get a data on RNA expression without any a prior assumptions of what is a gene or not a gene. And as you're sequencing RNA, you get all the isoforms, all alternative splice isoforms, and fusion transcripts, run-on transcripts, 
And as you know, we know now that you know, transcript fusions are pretty common in cancer. Like 50% of prostate cancers have fusions between TMP or SS2 and ETS. And because you're sequencing RNA, you can see mutations, and that would change protein function. And you get the most accurate and sensitive quantitation of all transcripts. So in the cartoon on the right top, I've shown the RNA fragmentation method of doing library prep. So RNA is broken into pieces with zinc. The pieces are converted into cDNA. You add adapters to it, and the adapted cDNA is sequenced and mass to produce gigabases of data. This method has uh, provided data at, uh, like I mentioned before, an unimagined resolution. So I'm showing you a small region of a chromosome in the right bottom panel, and you can see in that region, normal and cancer transcripts are compared with each other, and you can do this comparison at every region across the entire genome, and again, without any prior assumption of is there a known transcript or not. In the next slide, I'm showing you how the alternative splicing data looks from sequencing RNA. So in the image in the left panel, the figure label C is the current isoforms recorded in the database, Ensemble and other database. And in this database, there are only two known isoforms. But when you sequence the same gene, the RNA from the same gene, you get multiple isoforms. That indicates an incredible diversity of proteins. Again, something we hadn't imagined would exist. Figure A in that panel shows a universal RNA control, where again you see multiple isoforms, maybe three or four main protein types. We now know that alternative splice forms are quite important in the cancer paradigm. So table one from Rajan et al shows a clinically relevant splicing event in prostate cancer. And as we sequence more, we expect to find much more stronger correlates in this. In the next slide, I'm showing you how you can also access the coding SNPs. So as you're sequencing RNA, you'll be detecting all changes. So I'm showing you a homozygous and a heterozygous in the transcript. Again, very useful to establish the mutational changes, functional mutational changes in the cancer genome. So this whole world of RNA sequencing by this next generation technology in the next slide reflects our total change in the way we understand what the transcriptome is like. So I've shown a graphic of a human genome and in that human genome, we had initially believed around one to two percent of the genome is transcribed, and this is labeled as genes in the figure. But we now know that approximately half or even more of the genome is transcribed. And it's a very exciting time figuring out what this large plethora of transcripts are doing. And many are functional, some are structural. So it's kind of a new uh, day in the whole transcriptional analysis field. And RNA sequencing can be very easily performed in multiple tissue types. In the next slide, I'm showing you methods where you can access RNA sequencing from fresh tissues as well as from formalin fixed paraffin embedded. So in the FFPE samples and fresh, you essentially cannot distinguish. And I've just shown you two examples, mucin like one gene and when we showed this data the first time around, people could not separate that this is FFP or FRESH. So you can suddenly access a large library of tissue blocks with adequately well-annotated clinical data at an RNA sequencing level. Then the graphic below in this slide shows you a pretty long transcript, a 15 KB transcript, and even in FRESH or in FFP, it's still hard to distinguish. So you can access information which many people thought was not possible to do from formalin fixed paraffin embedded. So it's beginning to transform both on the method and the science side. So on the next slide, I'm going to focus on RNA sequencing on individual circulating tumor cells. So next slide. <laughs> 
So single cell RNA sequencing, the project I'm going to talk about specifically is defining a correlation between CTC, circulating tumor cells and tumors. And the questions we are specifically asking is circulating tumor cells may be present before the onset of a clinically apparent cancer or what is the change in a clonal population of a post-treatment? So do we skew the population one way or the other? And this single cell sequencing has a pretty big value for sequencing limited clinical samples and early stage cancers. So in the next slide, I'll show you specific data from single tissue culture cells. So we have captured LN cap, an individual LN cap cell, and T24 cell. And in this example, I'm showing you the lectin galactoside binding protein. And this is RNA expression at a single cell level. So in the panels below, this galactoside binding protein is expressed in T24, but not in LN cap. And the blue and orange boxes indicate individual reads from the sequencer. So you can get pretty accurate sequencing data with very high signal to noise. Another example in the next slide is prostate specific antigen, obviously highly expressed in LN cap but not in T24. And again, you can see very distinct and clear gene expression profiles at an individual cell level. Again, each panel is a single cell. So how do we do this? So in the next slide, I'm going to show you the method we've been using and how we capture single cells. Cells are labeled with antibody. We use PCAM for CTCs and CD45 for white blood cells. And these are mag-labeled antibodies. And then the antibodies label the cells, and the cells are captured by sweeping the fluid with a magnetic finger that sticks to the label antibodies. And the device on the right is what we use in-house to just sweep through a culture or a blood sample to capture the immunolabel antibodies. And the graph and the two pictures on the bottom shows you a live cancer cell captured by this process and a live leukocyte. I'm stressing live because this process delivers cells which can are culturable and fully viable. In the next slide, I'm summarizing a study with uh, CTCs. This was in collaboration with the Stanford Cancer Center who provided us blood samples from 10 prostate cancer patients. So these were labeled with EPCAM and the table summarizes individual cells. So we captured 12 cells and most of these cells produced a viable library and these viable libraries were then sequenced and we used a smarter kit from clone tech. So the single cell cDNA synthesis method from SMART is shown in the next slide. It's a pretty simple process. So single cells are placed in the lysis in the first buffer. Then cDNA synthesis is performed post lysis. Lysis is just done by heating the cells. And once the cDNA is extended, a non-template specific base sequence is added at the end of the cDNA. This non-template specific sequence is then hybridized to oligo called the smarter oligo, which allows us to copy the second strand. And this produces very high specificity and sensitivity. So by using this kit, we can actually detect a single cell. And I'm showing you results from the CTCs we captured before in the table. So in the next slide, I'm looking at AMA-CR, a prostate cancer marker, and it shows up clearly in the CTCs isolated from the prostate patients, prostate cancer patients. The white blood cell does not show any expression, and CTC G6 did not show any expression. So in the next slide, another example of CD24, again a prostate ca cancer specific marker, again shows that most of the CTCs are positive for CD24, but CTC G6 is not, and obviously WB cells are not. And in the next slide, we are looking at a leukocyte marker, a CD45 marker, 
and this is expressed only in the white blood cells but not in the other CTC cell line. So very strong definitive results so in the next slide. Sorry, one more example to bore you guys. This is KLK3, a very important gene in prostate marker. And again, you can see gene expression profile uh, with differences amongst the CTCs. Like the G5 is not expressing at that high level, but G6 is expressing a different isoform. So very exciting, very interesting results. So in the next slide, And when we combine this gene expression in a standard heat map, we can see very clear clustering for the CTCs. So the T24 breast cancer cell lines do cluster together. That's shown in the middle of this graphic. Five out of the seven CTCs show a distinct clustering pattern. The one on the right in this panel shows a different expression profile. And the white blood cells on the extreme right shows a different expression profile. The ones marked with the orangish arrows show not really a CTC, but a stem cell gene expression profile. So again, something pretty interesting about uh, cancer stem cells here. So in the next slide. So as you guys know, I can go on and on at the value of single cell sequencing, but I'd like to conclude here that we now know that RNA-seq is an extremely valuable method to understand the cancer genome because you can basically delineate the functional aspects of a cancer genome by sequencing the transcriptome. And single cell RNA sequencing is an effective method at producing a molecular phenotype. We can now very robustly and easily determine the gene expression profile by RNA sequencing on single CTCs and of course detect you know, mutational changes and isoform changes that happen in the CTC population. This technique is obviously not limited to cancer CTCs, but it also can be very applicable. So for example, there are a few exciting projects in the pipeline. One is producing a 3D transcriptome map of a brain at millimeter resolution. So the gene expression profile of brain tissue at millimeter block resolution would help us determine the functional aspects of a brain. Then, of course, embryogenesis and isolation and sequencing of fetal cells, other aspects. So I'm going to end here, and I'll pass it on to you, John. Thanks. And thank you, Abazar, for your discussion on RNA sequencing and its specific application to the study of circulating tumor cells. That was a very detailed and presentation, and there were lots and lots of uh, fascinating information presented, so thank you very much. If you are just now joining our webinar, a hearty welcome. As I mentioned earlier, we will be conducting a Q&A segment following the panelists' presentations. Please type your question for any or all of our panelists into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hit Submit. Our second panelist, Dr. Arby Thompson, will now begin his presentation on modeling the breast cancer transcriptome landscape. Aubrey. Thank you, John. I'm going to spend the next few minutes going over the highlights of some of our recent efforts to utilize RNA sequencing data to define the genomic landscape of breast tumors. Next slide, please. I think it's generally recognized that defining the genomic landscape of tumors is going to require several different kinds of sequencing analysis. And a great deal of attention has been focused on genome sequencing of both the germline and tumor DNA using either exome sequencing or more commonly, I think increasingly commonly, whole genome sequencing. What I'm going to talk to you about more today is transcriptome sequencing because I think it's becoming increasingly clear that RNA sequence analysis is going to provide a wealth of critical information that's going to be necessary for understanding gene structure and function in tumor cells. Next slide. So there are a great many very important genomic features that one can mine from RNA-seq data. Today I'm going to focus on three of these. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work that we've done with alternative splicing, the work that we've done using RNA-seq data to identify expressed nucleotide sequence variants, and more exciting work that we've been recently doing, identifying fusion genes and fusion transcripts in breast cancer. Next slide. 
So it's clear that in theory, one can mine RNA-seq data to identify and quantify expressed nucleotide sequence polymorphisms in tumors. And I think that's very important from two standpoints. One, it gives the opportunity to use RNA-seq data for discovery as a primary tool to discover and identify novel single nucleotide variants that are linked to the tumor phenotype. And equally important, this kind of approach is going to be necessary for validation of exome or whole genome sequence data to show that the variants that one identifies from genomic sequencing are actually expressed in the tumor cells and therefore likely to be functionally significant. Next slide. However, there are very significant challenges. One of the challenges that's most apparent, I think, is the fact that the dynamic range of RNA abundance is very great. And that presents an interesting set of challenges in terms of one's ability to confidently predict both abundant and low abundance SNVs. To a substantial extent, although I think not entirely, this problem has been overcome by the depth of sequence analysis that's now available from, for example, the HiSeq platforms, which facilitates the discovery of SNVs in low abundance RNAs. Next slide. So the major problem that most people have encountered in trying to detect SNVs in RNA-seq data is false detection ratio. The false detection rates are truly daunting. And this is due, I think, at least in part to the fact that the genotype calling algorithms that were developed and have been attempted to be used for, for this kind of approach were initially designed for germline DNA. And if there's one take-home lesson that I can give you right now is that the genotype calling algorithms, as far as we're concerned, don't work for RNA sequencing data. Next slide. So we've developed workflow that utilizes parallel alignment strategies with two different tools, TopHat and BWA. And we've tried to take advantage of the complementary strengths of both tools and to minimize the inherent weaknesses in each of these tools. And we use the tools to do things like eliminate duplicate reads, and eliminate reads that map to multiple loci. In addition, we filter for strand bias, which is a very, very common source of false positives in RNA-seq data. Most importantly, we use these tools only to define the nucleotide sequence. We ignore the genotype calls that are inherent in these two tools simply because they're just not useful for RNA-seq purpose in our hands. Next slide. So ultimately, we arrive at a set of candidates that are nominated by both alignment mechanisms, nominated by both TopHat and BWA. We then filter these through the 1,000 genome data set, dbSNP 135, and the 5,400 genome data sets to remove known germline single nucleotide polymorphisms. And then the filter, the SNVs that come through that, we then do through a final filtering, GATK filtering, to remove 5' prime N bias, which introduces a significant source of false positives into these data as well. So finally, we end up with a set of very, very high confidence novel SNVs that we can that we can assign to individual tumors. May I have the next slide? So I'm going to give you one example of that. This is a primary HER2 tumor that we have sequenced and run through our SNV detection pipeline to identify 80 novel SNVs that are unique to HER2 tumors. So I need to emphasize that the SNVs that we're working with here are not expressed in ER positive tumors, they're not expressed in triple negative tumors, and they're not expressed in benign breast tumor samples that we've analyzed to date. So these are HER2 unique single nucleotide variants. So we've nominated 80 of them in this individual tumor, and we were able to PCR amplify 78 of those from both the tumor and the patient matched normal DNA. And 77 out of those 78 were subsequently validated by Sanger sequencing. So we have a lot of confidence in our ability to use this protocol to identify SNVs with a very low false detection rate. And I should comment that the lowest SNV that we detected had a depth of sequence of four, coverage of four alternate reads at that cognate genomic coordinate and corresponded to 28 gene counts, which is pretty near the lower limits at which you can quantify messenger RNA abundance. So we're satisfied with the sequence, with the specificity of this protocol, and we're confident of our ability to use this approach to nominate and identify single nucleotide variants in individual tumors. If I can have the next slide. I'm going to show you a couple of examples 
This is MRPL3. As you can see from the top panel, the SNV that we detected was not detected in the patient matched normal tissue, but was clearly heterozygous in the tumor itself. And this is an example of one of the more common types, one of the more common observations that we make with these SNVs. But if I can have the next slide. We also see a lot of SNVs in which we can't detect, uh, which are not detected in the normal DNA. But when you look at the tumor DNA, these things are clearly less than heterozygous. So this, we think, represents an SNV that's expressed in a minor subpopulation of tumor cells. Here, an SNV in the very important chromatin remodeling transcription factor, FOXA1. Next slide. So, Using appropriate filters, we've been able to reduce our false detection rates to what we think is a manageable level. And by filtering against our germline databases, the majority of the SNVs that we've been able to detect from our RNA-seq data ultimately proved to be somatic mutations. Next slide. So I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about some of the work that we've done looking at splice variants. Now, Analysis of splice variants is every bit as challenging as analysis of SNVs, and we simply have not invested as much time and effort in splice variant analysis as we have for SNVs. If I can have the next slide. However, we've collaborated with an individual by the name of David Rossell at Barcelona to use a program that he's developed called CASPER. CASPER quantitates known RefSeq splice variants. So you get a limited amount of information from this. You can't detect novel splice variants, and that's a bit of a problem. But the virtue of CASPER is that it actually works, and we've been able to use it to detect alternative splicing patterns in tumor and breast cancer subtypes. If I could have the next slide. Shown here are two genes that are alternatively spliced uniquely in HER2 tumors, shown in the red box. They're not alternatively spliced in either triple negative or ER positive or in samples from benign breast disease biopsies. So these are simply examples of two genes that are alternatively spliced in the HER2 breast tumor subtypes. If I can have the next slide. So we can identify genes that are differentially expressed, the individual tumor subtypes. In this case, we're talking about genes that are individually expressed in HER2 tumors compared to either benign breast disease ER positive or triple negative tumors. We can identify genes that are differentially spliced in the HER2 tumors, and we can identify expressed nucleotide sequence polymorphisms that are unique to HER2 tumors. So the challenge really then is to integrate these genomic features into some kind of a landscape model that tells us something about the tumors. If I can have the next slide. So we've used Cytoscape and a variety of gene and protein interaction databases to define what we call a super network of HER2 specific genes. So this network is comprised of highly linked genes that manifest either differential expression, alternative splicing, or SNVs. As you can see from this representation, there are about 10 major subcomponents of this network. They're color coded, so each of those colors represents a different subnetwork. These subnetworks are very highly internally connected, and each of these is connected to the overall super network. So I like to think of this as the wiring diagram of HER2 tumors, and we believe that this kind of representation reflects several interconnected cellular processes that are essential for the establishment and maintenance of the HER2 tumor phenotype, and that's a hypothesis that we're very actively pursuing in the laboratory right now. Next slide. But the real key question is whether or not this systems biology approach to defining transcriptional landscape maps has any clinical utility whatsoever. So as an initial attempt to address that question, we've resorted to a genomic database that we've recently derived from 1,282 patients who received trastuzumab as adjuvant therapy for HER2 breast cancer. So we have clinical outcomes data for all of these patients. And this enables us to interrogate the data set with our wiring diagram model that I showed you just a minute ago. And by doing so, we've actually been able to identify a large cohort of genes that have some very interesting properties. These genes appear to be regulated by HER2 signaling, and they appear to convey sensitivity to taxanes. 
So we believe that this observation may account for the fact that concomitant therapy with taxanes plus trastuzumab works better for HER2 breast cancer than trastuzumab alone or taxanes alone or taxanes followed by trastuzumab. And testing this particular hypothesis is clearly a very major focus in the laboratory as well as in the clinic. So if I can have the next slide. Finally, I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking about uh, one of the most exciting developments that's come out of our efforts to identify fusion transcripts in breast cancer. We initially developed an analytical pipeline. We call it Snowshoes FTD, Snowshoes Fusion Transcript Detection that detects fusion transcripts and RNA-seq data with a very, very low false detection ratio. If I can have the next slide. We use this pipeline first to identify 55 novel fusion transcripts in a panel of 24 breast cancer cell lines. Next slide. And more recently, we've applied a variant of this Snowshoes FTD pipeline to the analysis of fusion transcripts in primary breast tumors. Next slide. So we completed the sequence of 24 primary breast tumors, eight each of the major clinical subtypes, ER positive, HER2, and triple negative breast cancers, plus eight samples from patients with benign breast disease. We analyzed these data to detect 131 novel tumor-specific fusion transcripts. Every breast tumor expresses at least one fusion transcript. Some 45 of these fusion transcripts are redundant. That is to say that they're expressed in two or more tumors. And among those redundant transcripts, seven of them are restricted to ER-positive tumors, and eight are restricted to triple-negative breast cancers. So there are tumor subtype-specific redundant fusion transcripts, or at least at the, le at the depth of sequencing that we've been able to achieve so far. Interestingly, we did not detect any HER2-specific redundant transcripts. Now, that's not to say we didn't detect redundant transcripts in HER2 tumors. We did, but the redundant transcripts that we detected in the HER2 tumors were also detected in either ER plus or triple negative tumors. So there's something unusual about HER2 tumors in this respect, and we're actually interested in that from a clinical perspective. If I can have the next slide. So a parallel series of mate pair sequence analysis has been carried out, and the results of this indicate that more than 95% of the fusion transcripts that we've been able to identify map to regions that have undergone chromosomal rearrangements, insertions, deletions, or translocations. We've detected several major clusters of rearranged genes in our breast tumors, including one that is specific for HER2 tumors, and that's shown by the blue arrow on chromosome 1 in this particular slide. There's one cluster of rearrangements that's specific for ER plus tumors. That's shown by the green arrow on chromosome 11 in this slide. And we detected three clusters of rearrangements that are specific for triple negative tumors as shown by the red arrows on chromosomes 8, 12, and 17. Next slide. So we're very excited about the potential clinical role of what appears to be a new class of breast cancer mutations that's really not been investigated or exploited in breast cancer. Now, there are some obvious questions that, that arise from these studies, the most obvious of which, of course, is what are the functions of these things, or the driver mutations, for example in breast cancer. We're also very interested in the fact that these fusion transcripts are tumor specific, so they represent in a sense ideal biomarkers for either tumor stratification within the intrinsic subtypes or perhaps for prediction of therapeutic response. And then finally, the most important question, really the holy grail of all of this, is are any of these druggable targets? So our genomic studies and those that everyone else is carrying out in breast cancer really is aimed towards identifying new therapeutic targets that we can exploit for management of breast cancer patients. And I hope that in the past few minutes I've been able to convince you that the information that one can derive from total RNA sequencing analysis is going to be very powerful in this endeavor. And then the final slide to give my thanks to my collaborators, Edith Perez, Jan Osman, Ronnie Kalari, and Brian Nacella,
without whom these experiments would have not been possible. The Breast Cancer Translational Genomics team, that's a very large team that's worked on this project, and most particularly to express my thanks for the patients without whose participation these studies simply would not have been possible. So thank you for your attention, and John, I'll return control to you. Aubrey, thank you for demonstrating on how to gain those critical insights on the genomic landscape of breast tumors and how to identify potential biomarkers and therapeutic targets. I'm really certain that a number of our audience members are going to have questions for you during our Q&A session on this extremely important topic, so thank you. Before we proceed, let me remind everyone of our Q&A segment that comes right after the panelists made their presentations. Please type your questions into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console, and then hit Submit. So continuing on our theme of RNA-Seq, our third panelist, Dr. Jeffrey Renna, is ready to talk about analyzing the bladder cancer transcriptome by RNA-Seq. Jeffrey? Thanks, John. Today I'm going to talk to you about our work in using RNA-Seq to analyze bladder cancer transcriptome with the goal of understanding how changes in the total RNA transcriptome affect protein networks. So this story starts off actually not with proteins, but with understanding how networks of interactions, such as those between proteins in a cell, are organized in topological fashion. In the next slide, so these are typically displayed as network graphs, and I'm showing you here on the first slide of the presentation, one such network graph, which is not between proteins, but is actually between scientists at a department at a university. And what you can see from this arrangement of how people interact, this is a social network, is that different people in different areas of science, such as those in mathematical ecology, highlighted with green, rarely interact, as denoted by the thin lines, with people studying the structure of RNA, which are those highlighted as yellow. So this kind of view of a network graph gives us an overall topology of how things are interacting. And so what's obvious from when we look at network graphs like this is that not all the components of the graph are interacting with each other at the same time and place. So just like social networks, in the next slide, I show you a protein network. So the, obviously proteins as the expression of the coding RNA interact with each other in networks very similar to social networks and through those physical interactions affect the cellular behavior in normal tissue but also in cancer. What I'm showing you on this graph is a circle that's actually comprised of a whole bunch of protein nodes. There's so many of them you can't really see them. And what's happening is that we're showing each protein and if it's interacting with a partner protein, it's connected by a line. And this gives a kind of spirograph-like image. And what we can see from this kind of visualization is that we can now color the line depending on whether proteins are interacting with each other in a coordinated fashion. And that's displayed by the average Pearson PCC or Pearson correlation coefficient. So green lines or edges, as they're called network graph theory, green lines show very good coordinated expression, whereas orange to red lines show poor coordinated expression. And when you visualize the human protein network this way and overlay it with expression from analysis of tissue, as is done here, you can see that some proteins that are the blue proteins shown here show very good correlation of co-expression. That is, they show good coordination of expression, whereas a bunch of other types of proteins, like the red ones, show poor or little coordinated expression. So with this organization of the, the genome, as presented in our paper published in Nature Biotech in 2009, we started to wonder whether there might be changes that are associated with disease, in particular cancer. And so in the next slide, I'm just showing you basically the outcome of those studies, which is where we looked at this kind of modularity of protein networks. So on the top left network, you see a bunch of little nodes. Some of them are connected by green lines, and this indicates that those proteins are interacting with each other, and that when you look at the expression of those proteins, their interactions are well coordinated. You can see that there's two such clusters in the good prognosis example that I'm showing you. This is just schematic. And you can see that those two well-coordinated clusters are connected by proteins that are not as well-coordinated as the left and right clusters. So what we were able to do is compare good prognosis cancer, in that case breast cancer, with poor prognosis. And we could show that, in fact, there were these changes in the organization of the protein network that were conferred by alterations in the gene expression profile. And so just to give you a schematic representation, 
this is sort of reflected in the bottom right, the poor prognosis cases, where we can see that some of these protein networks were typically well coordinated are now disorganized. And so by applying this across the entire protein network using genome-wide gene expression arrays, we're able to identify modularity networks that were disrupted in cancer and associated with poor progression. So this is it's an interesting application of gene expression interactions with proteomics, uh, but to apply this to the clinic is considerable challenge. And so in the next slide, I'll just highlight that challenge, and that is that Dynamo really requires information about how all proteins are expressed in the cell, not just a subset of those proteins, like a dozen or, or a couple hundred. They're typical of diagnostic signatures being applied now. And so really at the time, there was really no technology that existed in a clinically feasible format in which we could assess this in a clinically relevant setting. So in the next slide, I've summarized the challenges. We needed to develop and apply a technology that allows us to collect information about how all genes are expressed, and it needed to be in a typical clinical specimen, meaning formal and fixed paraffin embedded. But of course, FFP shreds the RNA molecules, and the amount that can be recovered from FFP biopsies is very small. And again, the RNA represents total RNA. So all of these seemed at the time to be insurmountable obstacles. However, with the advent of next generation sequencing, as well as bead arrays such as whole genome dazzle, there was opened up the possibility that these technologies could be applied and provide an effective strategy to access and analyze clinically relevant material for the types of analysis required by Dynamo. In the next slide, so in comparing a microarray, we compare RNA-seq versus microarray. Microarray, of course, is lower cost and faster. However, RNA-seq gives normally more information from the tumor. So RNA-seq is much more sensitive, requires much less RNA for analysis, covers the entire transcriptome, and it also gives us important sequence information associated with the tumor. So from the RNA-seq data, we can assess gene expression. We can assess non-coding RNAs, such as microRNAs and link RNAs. We can identify novel transcripts that might arise in specific cancers. We can also identify splicing isoforms, SNPs indels, and possibly gene fusion events. So from our perspective, as shown in the next slide, The winner was really RNA-seq, and so we set out then to develop RNA-seq and apply it to our analysis of protein networks. And to do that, in the next slide, I've just highlighted our work plan. So we were fortunate to have engaged in a very close and exuberant collaboration with uh, Dr. Alex Lauder, who's a clinical urologist here at, in Toronto, who obtained surgical resections or biopsy material. These are obviously prepared as FFD blocks section, and then they're evaluated by Dr. Theo Vanderquist, who's a pathologist here. And then the tumor regions are identified. The RNA is extracted from parallel sections, and for that we've actually established a partnership with the CLIA-certified clinical testing lab headed by Dr. Azarazad. This RNA is then subjected to RNA-seq analysis using DSN protocols. Since it's total RNA, we need to remove most of the ribosomal RNA that's done either by Lumina or currently in-house. And then finally, we're faced with, of course, an avalanche of data from these studies and that we've developed a data analytical pipeline in collaboration with Dr. Ben Blenkow, who's here at the University of Toronto. So Alex is particularly interested in bladder cancer. We think that actually bladder cancer is an important test example to apply this workflow. And so in the next slide, I'll show you why because bladder cancer, although relatively understudied as a cancer, is actually the fourth leading cause of cancer in men, approximately 5,000 new cases per year. And in fact, bladder cancer, unlike other cancers such as lung or colorectal, which undergo a very aggressive short-term treatment, many bladder cancers require long-term follow-up, active surveillance of patients, and because many of the indolent bladder cancers can recur at some frequency. So this is a very expensive disease and it requires constant intrusive monitoring. So developing any kind of useful tool that could guide in the treatment and management of this disease could make a significant impact on the patient's quality of life. So for this analysis, in the next slide, I'll just show you our proof of principle, which is the overview I'm going to discuss today. 
and that's the proof of principle. We took eight samples, four high grade, four low grade of these eight samples. Two of the high grades failed, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Of the six samples that succeeded, we ended up obtaining an enormous amount of information, which is shown on the next slide. So all of the samples yielded about 50 gigabases of information. That's about 15 times the size of the human genome. We got well over 500 million reads for each of the samples, and read depth is very important in obtaining good quality data at the end. And finally, a, a large percentage of the reads were at, effectively mapped to the genome, and we obtained a very small percentage of ribosomal RNA contamination. And so just before I jump into analyzing the RNA-seq data, I'll just get, do a little diversion to discuss why we think uh, some of the high grades tend to fail. And the next slide is shown two sections of some of the tumors that we analyzed on the left. You can see a relatively healthy tissue where there's lots of viable tissue in the region that was sectioned. And you can see in the right-hand slide that most of the areas is hemorrhagic with only a very small amount of tumor material viable. So in subsequent iterations of this strategy, as shown in the next slide, we are now getting the areas of viable tumor tissue marked by the pathologist, Dr. Vanderklaas, and then those sections are being scraped in adjacent FFP sections for extraction of RNA. And we believe that this will greatly improve the quality of the RNA prep and the outcome of the analysis. So now back to the RNA-seq data in the next slide. I'll just summarize then what analysis of total RNA-seq data can provide for us, and I'm going to take you through the top three that I've listed here. So the first thing is obviously coding RNA expression can be readily analyzed. In addition, as I mentioned before, we can identify non-coding microRNA as well as other non-coding RNA that I'll briefly touch on. In work that's ongoing, we can also identify novel transcripts as well as alternative splicing events that are associated with disease progression and as well as gene fusions and possibly mutational analysis, although I must say that this needs to be taken with a grain of salt since FFP can definitely lead to mutations in RNA associated with the tumor. In any case, I'll just take you through the first three, just give you a kind of overview of the type of data that we've obtained from this proof of principle study. And just it's informative just to look in the, uh, in the first case of how the data looks once it's been analyzed. In the next slide, So this is analysis of coding genes, and these are two adjacent genes on chromosome 7. And you can see the gene on the left, if you look at the bottom of the slide, there's a blue bar, and that indicates the gene, and the thick blue bars indicate the exon. And this gene actually happens to be going from the left to the right. And then if you look further to the right, down on the chromosome, you can see that there's a second gene there that's actually pointing from the right to the left, and it's got three major exons that you can see. And if you now look in the grayish area, you can see that there's a kind of waterfall-shaped data that's reflecting the mapping of, of individual reads to the genome. And the frequency of those reads can be seen in the kind of histogram that lies above the waterfall. And what you can see is on the left-hand gene, there's really no difference in the frequency of reads obtained depending on the disease type. However, on the right-hand side, we can see that the four low-grade tumors, which are at the bottom, play a robust transcript reads to the gene whereas above it, in the high grades, there's virtually no gene reads detected for this gene. So this indicates that two adjacent genes can display very different patterns of expression so associated with disease severity. If we now look at this graph, it also provides us another informative insight into the power of RNA-seq data, and that is the dynamic range, which we found for a number of genes to be quite enormous. And that's just displayed on the next slide. that gene I showed you on the right is actually sonic hedgehog, and that's shown on the graph here. And you can see that in the low-grade tumors, we're detecting anywhere from 5,000 upwards of 30,000 reads for the whole gene, whereas in the high-grade tumors, we obtained at the most 200 reads. So this represents dynamic ranges in the 10 to 50-fold range. And we can also detect much more low-abundantly expressed genes, such as interferon alpha-1, which is shown just below the sonic hedgehog. And you can see that in the high grades, we detected no reads at all, whereas in the low grades, we detected anywhere from 50 upwards of 300 reads. So again, we have these large dynamic ranges which make for robust um, tests. You can also, of course, detect high-grade associated signatures that display large read mapping in high-grade tumors compared to much, much lower read numbers in low grades. 
So if we just look at this then across the entire genome, we can then identify even this small little group of six bladder cancers. You can see on the next slide that we can readily identify grade associated microRNA clusters. And in fact, in this analysis, you can also reflect the high dynamic range of this data where deep green shows low expression going through to black, which is moderate expression to very high expression in red. And we can see that even in this preliminary analysis, we can identify tumor-specific expression of the mage family of genes, which have been identified in many cancers to be associated with tumor progression. So we believe that this method will allow us to identify robust coding RNA sequence signatures that are associated with GRADE. In the next slide, We'll talk a little bit about non-coding genes. And here, obviously, the, probably the most famous case of a non-coding gene is microRNA. And here we can see, again, that we're readily detecting microRNA clusters that are grade associated in this case. And again, the intensity of the color, you can clearly see that the dynamic range of these reads is quite large, providing for a robust detection platform. In the next slide, And another class of non-coding genes that we've started to get interested in based on these data is these long intergenic non-coding RNA. And again, here is an example of some link RNAs associated with bladder cancer grade. And again, the dynamic range of the link RNAs associated with grade is even larger than for coding RNAs. And this is actually consistent with what's been seen for link RNAs in tissue arrays, where the dynamic range between tissues is much higher than what's typically observed for coding RNA. So with that, I just wanted to give you an overview of the kinds of data that are arising from the application of RNA-seq to a clinically relevant setting. And I just wanted to go to the next slide to tell you that this is just a fraction of the results that we believe will arise from these types of studies. Still to come are analysis of alternative splicing, gene transfusions, mutational analysis, albeit with the caveats that I previously mentioned. And ultimately, we need to expand this to a fuller cohort and integrate it with the protein network information that I described at the beginning of the talk. In the next slide, I'm just summarizing then that we believe we can develop the transcriptome as a clinical tool by combining the expertise of our clinical collaborators, Dr. Zlata and Van der Klost, with a CLIA-certified uh, clinical testing lab headed by Dr. Azar Zad. This is coupled to a deep sequencing RNA-seq analysis, and then ultimately defining the RNA ohm of bladder cancer and integrating with network signatures. And so the future is to really take these, particularly the coding RNAs, and in the next slide, take all coding RNAs indicated schematically on the right-hand side, integrate it with the protein network that I showed you before, and then identify how changes in gene expression are affecting the topological structure of these protein networks. And from there, we should be able to identify network-based diagnostics and prognostics that should aid in the management of bladder cancer disease. With that, I'll just finish by thanking my collaborators in the next slide. Again, I mentioned Dr. Theo van der Kloss and Dr. Alex Zlata. Dr. Zlata is the Director of Urooncology at Mount Sinai Hospital and a clinical surgeon. Also, Dr. Van der Kloss is a noted pathologist in bladder cancer. Informatics is being done in collaboration with Ben Blenkow, in particular the Nuno Barbosa Moraes in his lab. And in my lab, Sunny Liu, Sergey Mokin, Ian Taylor, and Kim Chan have all contributed to this work. And Azar Zad provides our CLIA certified testing lab, which can obviously allow us to more rapidly move this pipeline to the clinic. Thank you, John. And thank you, Jeffrey. I want to extend my appreciation to you and to the entire panel for your excellent presentations. At this point, please allow me a little literary license. I'm going to refer to the new baseball season that just began. Uh, why am I doing that? Looks like you all hit home runs with our audience as we received a number of great questions from them. So let's get started with our Q&A segment. And Abizar, the first question is for you. Prostate cancer and white blood cells have established surface markers. What about cell types for which we have not yet identified unique surface markers to reflect heterogeneity in the cell population? What would be your approach to isolate single cells from such a population for transcriptome analysis? Uh, yeah, so, so that is a very good question. And, uh, 
So we, there are two approaches. So one is, of course, if you do not have a surface marker that is validated and that's specific to that cell type, you will not be able to capture that specifically. But if there are multiple uh, surface markers, you know, which identify, let's say, 20%, 30%, or whatever proportion of your populations, you can pool your antibodies and use that to pull out a larger fraction of your specific sample. So we're using that strategy, I think, for melanoma and a few other uh, CTCs, uh, where we use a pool of antibodies to capture a specific uh, or specific cell types. Thanks, John. Okay, and Abazar, another question. Mm -hmm. Any application of RNA-seq in cardiac or pulmonary fibrosis pathology so far? Uh, yes to cardiac, and I have to look through our databases on the pulmonary, uh, but uh, I, I would be surprised if it's not already been done. But yes, I will be looking and uh, responding later to that question too. And again, Abazar, uh, for your EPCAM-based isolation technique, mm -hmm. how do you know that you isolate only cells and not vesicle structures, which are known to be EPCAM positive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question, too. Uh, so the way we do the process is once the cells are captured, they are uh, quickly checked under a fluorescence microscope. So we use fluor-label antibodies and mag-label antibodies. And if the cells have you know, the appropriate structure and are viable, because if they haven't lice or in any other damage. So we, we exclude uh, non-cellular materials or other things from the samples. It's pretty high uh, signal to noise. And Abazar, when doing RNA-seq from FFPE samples, how do you select for mRNA, or are you sequencing total RNA? Yeah, so I think Jeff will address this question just after me too, but uh, uh, we, yeah, so mRNA doesn't work too well because the RNA is pre-fragmented in the formalin fixation and the embedding process. If you do poly A capture, you get just a small sample of your total RNA, you lose most of it. So we do total RNA, random prime cDNA, and we remove the ribosomal and other fractions by double-strand nucleus-specific enzyme. And you can also use ribo minus or other ribo uh, uh, removal techniques. But yes, it's total RNA, not poly A, and we use uh, ways to remove the ribosomal. And Aubrey, there has been a lot of interest lately in the so-called RNA-DNA discrepancies, transcripts that do not correspond in sequence to the genome. Have you any evidence of this phenomenon in your breast cancer RNA sequence data? But, you know, these, these transcripts, I think, were, have been fairly widely discussed. We've, we've looked fairly carefully, and, and I think at the depths of sequence that we're using now, we've not seen much evidence for um, those kinds of discrepancies. I, I, I think that, that it's fair to say, in fact, we've not seen any um, transcripts that we have in, in which we have high confidence of the, um, the call as an SNV that we've not been able to duplicate by uh, Sanger sequencing from the, the corresponding DNA. So I'm, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I think that, that uh, at least from the perspective of our data, we just have not seen that phenomenon. Okay, Aubrey, and um, your workflow for detecting SNVs from RNA-seq data appears to have a low rate of false positive discovery. Do you have any idea of the false negative discovery rate? Yeah, that's an outstanding question. Um, no, <laughs> we're 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 obviously pursuing that. Um, it it it's actually becomes a, a sort of a difficult question to answer because the only way we've thought of being able to do that would be to do whole genome sequencing or exome sequencing and say, okay, we know that that these SNVs are present in the genome. Are they then also present in the transcriptome? If the answer to that question is yes, of course we're happy. If the answer to that question is no, we don't know whether that represents false uh, uh, negative discovery or whether it means that that particular transcript is not expressed. So we're, we're, we're very interested in that question and I think working very hard to try to answer it. But at this point, I'd, I would be hesitant to, um, uh, to, to venture what our false negative rates are. Our false positive rates are low. 
um, our false negative rates, I think, are not – we don't really have a feeling for that right now. I, I don't know whether, you know, Jeff or any of the other uh, participants have um, looked at that or not. Well, I have another interesting question here, Aubrey. You mentioned that HER2 breast tumors don't seem to have a redundant fusion transcript. Can you speculate as to why this should be the case? Okay, so, so initially HER2 tumors have redundant transcripts. They, they just don't have isotype-specific redundant transcripts. So, so we've, we've identified a fair number of these transcripts in the HER2 tumors, but they're also um, expressed in either triple negative or ER positive tumors. Um, why then are there not, is there not, have, have we not seen a class of redundant transcripts that are unique to HER2 tumors? Uh, yeah, we really at this point don't know how to answer that question, although I, I, my suspicion is that, that, that amplification of the ERB2 gene and establishment of, of signal transduction downstream of uh, what essentially is thermonuclear levels of expression of the HER2 receptor probably reduces the pressure on those cells to generate other kinds of mutations may reduce the pressure uh, to um, undergo chromosomal instability, and that may account for the fact that there are, in general, fewer fusion transcripts in HER2 tumors than there are, for example, in triple negative tumors or ER positive tumors. Having said that, I think one of the most interesting things that we've come across, there is a subset of HER2 tumors that has a very high level of fusion transcripts, comparable to the triple negatives and the ER positives. And uh, we're, we're interested in the possibility that there may be a subset of HER2 cancers that have a high level of genomic instability and that there may be some clinical significance that's associated with that high level of genomic instability. And those are concepts that we're obviously very interested in testing in our clinical samples. And Aubrey, do you have any evidence for transplicing as a mechanism to generate hybrid transcripts? Yeah. So we've, you know, the, the, it's a question that comes up all the time. Um, the obvious question when, when we identify these chimeric RNAs, these fusion transcripts, the obvious question is what is the mechanisms? Um, the majority of the high confidence uh, fusion transcripts that we've identified, we've been able to map to genomic uh, rearrangements by uh, mate pair sequence analysis. And I, I would say that in our hands, at least 90% of the high-confidence fusion transcripts can be mapped to genomic rearrangement. So they're good markers for genomic rearrangement. So what about, what about the others? What about the ones that we can't map to genomic uh, rearrangements? Well, in some cases, I think those arise as a result of minor subpopulations of cells that have genomic rearrangements that we simply can't tease out from the background of the total cell population at the level of mate pair DNA sequencing. In some cases, they may actually arise from either some sort of peculiar read-through transcription process or from transplicing. Um, I should say that, that I believe it is the case that all of the transcripts that we've not been able to validate at the level of genomic rearrangements are inter, no, excuse me, intra-chromosomal. Um, some of them are several million base pairs apart, so we think they probably don't arise as a result of transcriptional read-through, but we just really don't know yet. Some of, this, some of it may be annotation errors that we simply haven't been able to filter yet in our pipeline. So I, I don't know. I, I'm not, um, I, we don't really have a lot of evidence, I think, that speaks to transplicing one way or the other. But thank you for explaining there, everybody. Thank you very much. Jeff, we have a question on the RNA-seq technique. How does RNA-seq compare to gene expression arrays in terms of accuracy and sensitivity? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we've done fairly extensive analysis uh, of a variety of samples, not these particular samples, but in a number, number of other scenarios, uh, comparing beta ray and micro ray uh, with RNA-seq. And, and I think that RNA-seq uh, has, has First of all, a much more dynamic range. It's essentially a non-saturable um, assay. Uh, it's very good at detecting lower abundant uh, transcripts. Uh, and the, um, the accuracy of the, of, the, uh, of the data is just much, much higher. In fact, uh, I told everybody in my lab now to, um, to abandon microarrays and, and to just do everything with RNA-seq. Uh, 
Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have another question. Um, the percent mapping is extremely good for FFPE samples. Are you doing something special that accounts for such good libraries? Uh, yeah, so I think that the key, so we have, of course, I'm showing you, um, uh, we have other FFPE experiments in workup that, um, that obviously were not as good as the more uh, polished ones that I showed. And they tend to lead to lower uh, um, uh, map reads. And, and when we look into what the problems are, uh, what it is really is that a lot of those unmapped reads turn out to be uh, ribosomal RNA sequences. So um, typically if there's a poor um, mapping, uh, it's, it's related to the in, uh, inefficient uh, removal of ribosomal RNA. That seems to be our experience. And Jeff, for RNA-seq from FFPE samples, what proportion of the clean reads can be mapped to the transcriptome? Uh, well, again, I guess this is a related question. Uh, it, it, if the uh, subtraction of the ribosomal RNA is good, then you're, you can get anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of the um, reads mapped to the um, to the genome. Um, so it's actually quite good. If the if the ribosomal subtraction is inefficient, then uh, you end up with a lot of reads that are just you just swamp the sequencer with ribosomal sequences, and so uh, they really interfere with the uh, the efficiency of the method. And another question, Jeff. Why is DSN necessary for FFPE samples? Will Ribo Zero uh, R RNA removal kits be enough to remove our RNA? Um, yeah, I would suspect that uh, we just haven't tried them. We've been using uh, the DSN method for our uh, major um, uh, methodology. Uh, so there's, I have no reason to believe that other methods wouldn't be uh, as effective or efficient as DSN to remove ribosomal uh, sequences contamination. And Jeff uh, is a fan of yours, a gentleman named Ozan from Turkey. He's an ex-student of yours. Ah, Ozan, okay. And he first wants to send his greetings to what he, he calls you your great PI. His question, uh, gene, ex uh, gene expression levels would change during a cell's lifetime and context. How would this affect while drawing conclusions from sequencing experiments? Uh, well, it's great to hear from Ozan. I guess this really is international since he's in Turkey. Um, yeah, so I think in, the, in our case, it's, pro, it's true that cells um, would, you know, as they sort of go through their lifespan, for instance, going into cell division, will change their gene expression patterns. And this would be particularly intriguing uh, with respect to the single cell analysis that we saw um, presented earlier. Uh, in my case, in our case, we're looking really at tissues. So we're looking at, I guess you could say, the average of, of gene expression across the, uh, across the tissue. So... Um, gene expressions that occur with rare cellular events, say, uh, um, say in cell division or something, uh, would probably be less likely to be seen uh, in the context of our analysis. And so what we're really seeing is the average of, of gene expression of, of hundreds or thousands of cells. Yeah, Jeff, uh, you must have certainly made an impression on Ozam because it's uh, you know, late in the evening over there in Turkey. So yeah, I'm did... wondering what time it really is. <laughs> so, so he did call in. Hey, Aubrey, we have a, another question for you. Uh, do you see recurrent allele-specific transcription in any of your breast cancer subtypes, essentially a loss of heterozygosity at the level of transcription? Yeah, the answer to that question is yes. I mean, I, I, I would not claim that we see that in a subtype restricted manner, but we have in individual tumors seen um, examples of SNVs that were, um, uh, I guess, essentially, and I, I hesitate to use words like homozygous, but, but where the, we've seen examples of transcripts in which the alternate allele was expressed at very, very, very high frequency relative to the reference allele. But when we went back and looked at the DNA, that they were essentially heterozygous. Um, I, I don't know what accounts for that phenomenon, but indeed we have seen that. Well, thank you very much. I, I just want to say this has been a real timely focused and a wonderful webinar, but what always happens in these sooner or later, the clock tells us it's time to go and we have run out of time. But please note that this webinar will be archived for six months on our website www.genengnews.com. If you miss parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to your colleagues and friends. Thanks again to the panel for your outstanding presentations, and I want to give a big thank you to our audience for your attention and for your extremely thoughtful questions about various topics that were brought up during the webinar. 
And a thank you to our sponsor, Lumina, who made this event possible. Shortly, we'll be sending you a survey, and we would appreciate your feedback on this webinar. Please look out for it and kindly give us your thoughts, as this will help us to continue to bring you topical and timely webinars in the future. Thank you, and have a great day or a great evening if you're in Turkey or wherever. Bye-bye.